يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته متن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وبعد Since we started going over one of the fatawa that were distributed by Sheikh Albani or one of his uh, guidelines, then inshallah maybe it's better to continue with this just to make sure that we do not run out of time later on without having the chance to cover this, which is very important. And the translation that was made... Uh, by a brother from England is in some places lacking and especially in terms of remarks or footnotes because sometimes the Sheikh uses an expression that is understood to those who are familiar with his way of expressing but somebody who is was reading a literal translation would not understand what's meant so we can go over it together and understand what it says and then we go over the rest of the discussion of the subject of wasatiyah uh, and ghulu. The question says and as you will see from from reading it that in many cases you do not see a complete sentence because this is transcribed from a tape from the slang language in a tape so sometimes there are no verbs in the sentence or the sentence is meant is said without completing its meaning but the meaning is somewhat implicitly understood and so on anyways uh, if you if you find that there are some parts that are not clear Inshallah tell me and I will cl- try to clarify them for you The questions posed to Shaykh Al-Albani rahimahullah About Which means my question is regards Regarding a Salafi Who holds The Salafi Aqeedah Or beliefs With regard to Allah's names and attributes And his method his methodology in weighing the evidences is principally the book and the sunnah and not being restricted by a madhab. So in general, a person is Salafi in terms of beliefs of Asma and Sifat and also in terms of taking the evidence from, uh, from the Dalil. However, in many situations, he imposes his own view and ishtihad. Thinking that it is something good and, and beneficial, and that it is prescribed, and that it would benefit Islam and strengthen it. So, he feels that it is right to... <coughs> be part of a jama'ah and by jama'ah he means here the questioner he means jama'ah by the understanding of many of the 
common people in our time, which means a, se- a party, not a sect, a party of those da'wah parties of our time. Like Ikhwan Muslimun, like Hizb tahrir like Jama'at Tabligh, like something, uh, some other groups. So he feels that it is right to take a jama'a or to be with a jama'a and a party and to give bay'ah or pledge of allegiance and so on. Or he sets up a jama'a or an organization, for example, which aids and supports this hasbiya or partisanship in a different manner. Whether manifestly, which means openly, or in a hidden manner. Then, such a person differs with us with regard to some rulings pertaining to the rulers, or some groups, and so on. So thus, does this difference between us and him allow us to say that he is not upon the methodology of a Salaf al-Salih, but rather he is from the sects that are heading toward destruction, meaning from other than the saved sect, uh, out of the 72 sects? So that's the question. Is the question clear? Is it clear? What's the save sex? The save sex. First of all, it is recommended to sit when there is a class of knowledge to sit in a way to show respect of the knowledge. Unless you are very, very, very tired, that is the only way you can sit. Okay. Uh, se- secondly. We covered this before in a previous lecture, but for your benefit, inshallah, because you were so quick to respond, I'll tell you that there's a hadith in which, it's, which says that this ummah, the Muslims, will be divided into 73 sects. All of them will be in the fire, except one, one sect, and that is the one upon which I am and my companions are which means the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. So only the group of Muslims who are upon the way of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions is the saved sect or the saved group. Okay? So the question is, would we regard this person as being of the saved group or that he is, he would be of the people of Bid'ah? And uh, the doomed sex. Now the answer, as you as you probably understand from the question, that and And to see where is, I'll tell you the reference for this uh, question because I mentioned I, I missed to include the number of the tape the, the tape number where this answer came from because at the end of the answer it says number one but number one is not available it's on a different page so inshallah I'll bring you the answer but it is from a recent tape one of the recent tapes of Al-Albani rahimahullah before his death uh, the question is basically asking about a problem that we deal with, but it could spill, or we used to deal with, but it could spill into another problem that we deal with now. It's basically asking about people who, quote unquote, we call them sururis. Because what, what we mean when we say a person is sururi? <coughs> I mean, this is a very wide term that could apply to people. For example, Muhammad Surur, who is in England now, he says that he denies that he has an organization. 
and that he has uh, followers or bayah or things like that. But there is a manhaj or a methodology which he propagated in his magazine as Sunnah. And you see this kind of methodology uh, present in the actions or behavior of many people. So we, go, we say, that's why I said between two codes is because some of them, we don't know if they have actual underlying organization or not. They deny it, many of them. But there are some indications that there is such an organization. Uh, from the way they act, they behave like the people in Ayana or in other parts of the world who are part of this manhaj. You find that they behave in a very well organized, very systematic has be party like manner so that's obvious and according to Sheikh Muqbil for example he said he, may, he, he said I make an oath that or something to that effect that Surur, Muhammad Surur told him that he has or confessed to him that he has an organization and this is uh, mentioned in the book al Qutbiya for whoever read it in Arabic. I don't know if you have a copy of it here. You have copies? Okay. So it brings the quotation from Sheikh Mukbil that he was told by Surur uh, or he was able to make him force him to confess that indeed yes he has an organization. But whichever is the case, whether there is an actual organization or not, this is not what is most important. What's important is that there is a methodology. There is a manhaj. And we see it everywhere. And this man has... Yeah, yeah. Shukra. 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 Everything. <laughs> uh, so, we see it, and we see in it the same symptoms that we used to see before it in the da'wah of Ikhwan Muslimin. When we used to be to, to, to be in contact with them and to suffer from their hasbiya and their animosity. So we see the same thing. So what are the symptoms? Except that, with an exception, that the sururi da'wah is uh, advocates the Salafi aqidah. Whereas the Ikhwan tell you, you can be whatever. You can be Salafi, you can be Khalafi, you can be Ash'ari, you can be whatever you want. The important thing is to be part of our party, of our organization. So the Sunuris on the other hand, they have this distinction that, and this is probably part of the reason is that this da'wah is strongest and mostly established in Saudi Arabia, among the youth of Saudi Arabia. And as you know, the... Uh, Correct aqidah, the Salafi aqidah, in terms of the names and attributes of Allah, is very clear over there. So there is no compromise in that. So we find that this is a feature of it, that it has a correct aqidah in terms of asma and sifat. And I try to, I'm trying to emphasize this, that not in all parts of aqidah, specifically in the names of and attributes of Allah, and... Even that, we get to a point where we differ with them in the regard in regard to the hakimiyah, because they, some of them at least, will single out al hakimiyah as a separate part of aqidah, of the tawhid of al-rububiyyah, of or al-uluhiyah or both. They make it something separate, and they emphasize it so much because of their love of or uh, interest in uh, emphasizing the uh, uh, takfir of the rulers who do not uh, practice the hakimiya or the who, who do not uh, offer the full hakimiya to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an imam Inshallah, during the question and answer, uh, answer session. Inshallah. If you hang on, hang on long enough, inshallah, you'll know the answer. So, uh, 
this is one feature and in, in, in terms of aqidah asma al sifat they are clear about it in, in general or they emphasize it in terms of ishtihad and taqlid they are in general salafis in matters of furu'a of fiqh which means they are with us that we take things based on the dalil Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah so what is the difference then? the difference is that they are not with us in terms of matters of hizbiyah they have they come together as a hizb as a group as a party that whoever belongs with, with them is they give him full support and full love and full alliance and whoever is not part of that party he is rejected and disliked and hated and warned from and expelled so this you see clearly in their actions and as I said whether they have bay'ah or not you see this if you go to their programs and you show support to them you are their beloved one if you don't you are under their attack day and night and for those who have not contacted them at close uh, distance they probably don't know this but as you come closer to them you will realize this we have seen this in many parts of this country including the brothers who used to live in or who lived who still, some of them still live in Wisconsin near the Juma magazine brothers who live in some parts of Texas where there is some presence for them or some existence uh, brothers when we used to deal with them at the level of Al-Quran and Sunnah society and various other examples of brothers dealing with them directly you find that they have very strong hizbiyah another feature is what I already mentioned earlier takfir they support the takfiris even though they probably will not go to the level to the degree of jama'at al-jihad or jama'at takfir wal hijra but they are not against that direction because what they do is they emphasize political matters criticism of the rulers uh, uh, the uh, uh, political methods of changing the situation of the Muslims which are not necessarily the Islamic means of tarbiyah and tasfiyah or tasfiyah and tarbiyah so you find in that they are they work on building emotional emotionally hyped individuals and of course their greatest following is from the youth from the students of universities and colleges and uh, also from those who have dislike of the rulers even if they are uh, uh, and in some cases they are wealthy people that they give them a lot of support uh, monetary support and this is the case in Saudi Arabia many of the big uh, donors of money their money goes to organizations like that and to individuals with that kind of uh, ideology or methodology so I'm saying this to be clear because we are talking about wasatiyah and we'll be giving more examples later inshallah in the course of this talk so when we talk, when we criticize one side it doesn't mean that we accept the other side we do not accept the sururis, we do not like them we totally dislike them because we know that they are destructive to us they are causing harm to us Uh, not direct harm only but the indirect harm which is worse because by their action they are as I said earlier in the previous lecture they cause the rulers and the governments to target us without reason and therefore they will not leave us alone to teach the people and educate them them and guide them so that's a big harm that they are doing to us and to the deen in general so that is why we dislike them Uh, and we have to warn from them but on the uh, I mean that's one thing that we have to be careful about so that when we on the other hand criticize the other our brothers who are going to the other extreme it doesn't mean that we like those people, no we do not like them 
So, so this is uh, this has to be emphasized very much. Uh, so, uh, as you see from the this, from the question, it seems that the person is describing an example of a hez, of a hezbi, uh, and hezbi by hezbi it means a person uh, who practices partisanship, and partisanship, as I explained earlier, is that you would favor the fa- the, the people who are in your party, uh, the Muslims in your party in your group. Even if they are wrong And disown Or do not favor those who are From outside of your party Even if they are right So that's Hezbiyah So it seems that The question is describing a Hezbi person And asking the Sheikh Can we say about such a person That he is not Salafi No, 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 I'm, I, I'm saying, I'm guessing from the description of the person that this is what we understand to apply to the sururis. And as I said again, between quotes sururis, because uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not uh, putting myself in a position that I want to prove that there is a sururi organization or there is not. Because this is not important to me. <coughs> what I know is that there is sururi fikr or methodology. And that is what we need to be careful about because it causes destruction to its holders and to other Muslims as well, like ourselves. And the description here in the hadith, in the question is about a person who is of that type of methodology. Because it says that he uh, carries the aqidah, the correct aqidah in terms of asma and sifat. And that he accepts the dalil in terms of fiqh issues, he doesn't follow a specific madhab. But on the other hand, he follows hasbiyah, he has hasbiyah, he, he has uh, a jama'ah that he calls to its bay'ah, and so on. So the answer of the shaykh, the reality, and you see that his answer is very fair, even though. He could have said from the beginning, such a person is not Salaf, you don't deal with him. But he does not want the question to be put in the wrong place or misunderstood in the wrong manner. So he has to clarify it and say what exactly he is referring to in his answer so that it's not extrapolated in the wrong way. So he says, the reality, as we witness in this time, in our days, is that there is... This translation is weak, as you can tell. He's saying there is some going beyond bounds, which means there is some ifrat. And some falling short, which means some tafrit. So he's saying there is some ifrat and some tafrit, which means there is some excessiveness in one direction or in the other. In answering the likes of this question. So when answering this question, some people he's saying go to Ifrat, some people go to Tafrit, which means they do not give a balanced answer, a fair answer, and that is what he will inshallah give. So it is fitting that each person be examined individually, which means if I give you a general answer that would apply to everyone, you would say, okay, the Sheikh said, this, this applies to you, therefore you are not Salafi. Or the Shaykh said this, therefore you are Salafi. But maybe it did not mean me. He's talking about a general uh, hypothesis. So it's fitting that each person be examined individually and his words weighed and measured with the true balance. If we look at some of the Imams of as Salaf al Salih, and at some of the views and ishtihads, their views and ishtihads, then there is no doubt that we find some mistakes that they have made conflicting with the authentic sunnah. So he's saying even the imams of the salaf, they would make mistakes which show 
confliction with the sunnah, conflict with the sunnah. However, as long as we have known from them that they cling to the correct methodology, the book, the sunnah, and what as salaf al salih were upon, despite differing in some aspects of that, Here the sentence is not completed of course But as I, as I told you before Sometimes The sentence from the way the person is speaking You can get What he means in the rest of the sentence He's saying As long as we know that they cling to the Quran and Sunnah And the guidance of the Salaf Then they are okay So then they are okay This part is not there But you have, it is implicit Despite differing in some aspects, even if they are wrong in some aspects. For example, if a companion says a saying and no one contradicts him, then is such a saying proof or not? Can this saying be taken? In other words, if an op- a companion, one of the Sahaba, has a statement or an opinion, and it is not known that other companions disagreed with him. Can we take his statement as an evidence that cannot be rejected? In other words, the hujjiyya of the deeds of the Sahabi. That's what they call it in the matters of fiqh. This matter is not, is controversial among the scholars. And we would say yes in answer to this. But it doesn't mean that all the scholars will say yes. So some of the scholars say that it is not, whereas others say it is. So the differences like this do not necessarily take a person who disagrees, even if he's mistaken, out of being or remove him from being upon the methodology of as salaf al-salih. Okay, differences which are acceptable, differences which are I have room for, you know, uh, differing and uh, presenting the uh, evidence and so on. Now, history repeats itself. Which means as we say this about the past and the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and so on, and the Salaf, we should say, we can say the same in our time. This individual who attributes him to a Salaf al-Salih, it will be said that he is with the Salaf al-Salih or against them, According to how close or distant he is in reality in regard to this claim. So, so he can claim as much as he wants to be that he is part of the followers of Salaf al Salih. But the only thing to prove the truth of this or the falsehood is his actual practice. Therefore, it's not correct. To unrestrictedly remove any individual who openly declares, at least with his tongue, and as long as he does not contradict by his actions that which he declares with his tongue, then it is not correct to say that he is not a Salafi, nor not as long as he calls to the way of the Salaf al-Salih, and as long as he calls to the people, calls the people to follow the book and the Sunnah, and not to blindly and obstinately cling to a single imam not to mention blindly and obstinately clinging to a Sufi order Salam. not to mention blindly and obstinately clinging to a party see I told you he'll make it <laughs> sorry <laughs> however yeah yeah, no, no, not necessarily. I mean, it means that if he is considered Salafi, let's say, even without naming himself as Salafi, even if he has a reservation for that name, yeah, yeah, even that, I mean. He doesn't mean specifically the name. He means... It's not a condition. A method, 
a manhaj. If he if he is considered to be upon the manhaj, then you have to see whether he is really close to it or not, uh, or he violates such a claim. However, this ing- individual has views which isolate him in some matters of ishtihad, and this is bound to occur, since even the imams of the Salaf differed with regard to some matters. However, what matters to us. As I told you, I mean the translation is somewhat poor, but uh, inshallah, when, it, when this is published, it will be corrected. All of this will be published, uh, inshallah, corrected and published probably first in the Huda paper and then in a book. So it says, does he believe? Uh, however, what matters to us is the principle. Does he believe in it? Does he call to it? So we know, as we have more than once said, that you do not find upon the face of earth a group, at least from those who say that they are from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, who says that the way of the pious predecessors, the Salaf, is wrong. Even if they do not follow this way in reality, yet, Still, they are not able to say that it is wrong. So this individual who calls to the following of the Salaf, both in reality and Da'wah, who may disagree in some details, then we are not able to remove him from his attribution, which he publicizes openly that he follows due to some we cannot remove him due to some violations. However, these violations may be matters of an individual nature, such as that only, such that they only affect him personally, or affect those who are close to him, or they be things that may greatly affect the society also. Thus, this affects. Thus, this effect will either be far or close to the methodology of the Salaf al-Salih. But as for describing these individuals who call to the following of the book and the Sunnah, but not just this alone, but upon the methodology of Salaf al-Salih, but they may differ in some matters, then it's not fitting that we accuse them of being upon something other than the way, unless they proclaim this openly. So, for example, it has reached us it has reached us, which means it has come to our knowledge from some of them that they say we follow the Salaf in their Aqidah and in their knowledge but not in their means. So this is a fundamental contradiction to the methodology of the Salaf al Salih. Indeed, it is contrary to the da'wah of the Messenger وسلم, who gave full importance to Tawheed in the Meccan period as is known. The other jama'at who say that they are upon the book and the sunnah do not give importance to the call of Tawheed. Indeed, you may find among them those who say that this most important da'wah splits the people and does not gather them. So we must distance, dis, distance it from the Tao. So these people for certain are not Salafis. If some people reach the likes of this level in distancing themselves from the Salaf, even if he attributes himself in his words and in his Dawah to being upon the methodology of the Salaf, then it is merely a word which he says. Okay, that's it. Now let me explain or summarize to you what he said because it may not be very clear and to try to connect the beginning with the end to present a clear picture of, of everything he was asked about a person who follows the Salafi Manhaj in terms of Aqidah in terms of, and we said the Aqidah is specifically in Asma and Sifat, names and attributes of Allah. Who follows also the Salafi Manhaj in terms of 
Fiqh matters. He bases his, uh, or he takes uh, the fiqh of matters based on the evidence from the book and the sunnah. But on the other hand, in matters of practices, of making da'wah, calling to Islam, he practices something else other than the way of the salam. He calls to bay'ah and he to hasbiyah and things like that. The question was, can we consider this a Salafi or not? And the Shaykh, as I said, he was careful in answering, even though the translation probably does not reflect it clearly, that before he wanted, he, he gave the answer which came at the end of his answer, he wanted to clarify that his answer, he does not want his answer to apply to people who are actually Salafis but have some mistakes. So if we find a Shaykh of the Salaf, of, this, of those who make da'wah to the Salaf, to the Salaf, the Salafi manaj. And uh, I don't know if it is a good example, but to me it is an acceptable example to take the example of Shaykh Adnan Ar-Ur. So Shaykh Adnan Ar-Ur, he has mistakes. And of course there is no one but has mistakes. He has mistakes, and his mistakes are probably... Uh, mistakes that are against the Salafi manhaj. But at the same time, the da'wah that he calls to is the Salafi da'wah. The aqidah that he calls to and carries is the, is the Salafi aqidah. The call to fiqh uh, issues is the Salafi way of using the dalil and so on. He is against Hasbiyah. He is against Bay'ah. And he calls people to the way of the Salaf in all of its aspects. And he says, I'm a Salafi and we should be Salafis and we should call to the Salafi way. Now, some people have found some mistakes in his books, in some of his books or some of his tapes. Does this make him a non-Salafi that we should disown him and attack him openly and secretly and so on? According to what I understand from the statement of the Shaykh, you have to be careful in, with such people who have erred and made mistakes in some areas, you cannot simply like that expel them from the da'wah. Rather, you have to be considerate and be careful in approaching these people. Maybe you can give them nasiha advice and hope that they accept their advice because your advice is not enforcing on them. And uh, especially if it is matters of Ijtihad, as he described, or else matters of personal frictions, as I'm saying from me, not he didn't say this. Then in that case, they may not accept the advice. But still, it would hold that they have mistakes in some areas. That does not mean that we have to burn them out or to remove them from the record because they, are, they have made mistakes, they are, therefore they are all bad now. And even though just a few months or years before, we used to take everything from them, whatever they say, without questioning. So this is, this seems like a bit of excessiveness in dealing with such individuals. So the shaykh in the beginning, he was emphasizing that don't make a mistake in my in understanding my answer that I will give you next. Because uh, such question has to be taken on individual level, in the, uh, individual cases. So you take each case separately. Uh, instead of asking me for a general question uh, and taking a general rule, I'm telling you that this has to be dealt with at individual level. So for any specific person, you ask me, I tell you, if he is like that, he has made mistakes in some areas, but in general he is Salafi, then he is. On the other hand, if, he, if his aqidah is He says his aqidah of the salaf But I do not take my manhaj from the salaf My da'wah from the salaf Rather I make I have bay'ah and hasbiyah and asabiyah And so on and so forth And I do not want to Start with tarbiyah and tasfiyah And waste my time on educating the people I have a more important mission Of establishing the rule of Islam Killing whoever stands in that In my way and causing havoc on earth, then such 
such a person, how can we consider him a salaf? So this is basically what the answer of the Shaykh is. Uh, you had a question, Ya Salim. That's, that's a very good question and I was hoping to get to it later but since it's asked, we answer it now. No, no, that's fine because we don't know how much time we'll have at the end so maybe we will miss some of these important points. Uh, the question is that the answer of the Shaykh, if I understood it correctly, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the answer of the Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah was in regard to people who have the ability to make judgments. But how about the common people? who have no such ability and who are now getting into labeling others by saying that this is Salafi and this is not Salafi and this has minor mistakes and this has major mistakes is their position a correct position or what kind of uh, advice we can give to them is this basically what uh, your question is? Exactly. And then at the same time, you have some people who are in touch with some of the scholars who may have uh, made proclamations concerning some individuals. Uh, for the common people, the you know, which they be in relationship to this, there's sometimes an aspect of Dixie Lobby, right. where a person makes the wrong judgment with one other, and if they're correct, they get two. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's, as I said, a very good question. And before answering it, I would like to point that. And when we read the previous fatwa of Sheikh, and you have it on the first page, it's a one page fatwa or the last page, whatever, he partially answered this question. Or there is a partial answer to this question. Or part of my question and answer would be there. Part taken from there. Because he's saying that you should not, or the people should not normally get into these matters of labeling others because there's some more important mission for us some more important job for us to do and that is to seek the knowledge why are we wasting our time in those other issues that do not benefit us in any way except to bring hatred and animosity into our hearts that's exactly what he's saying in the uh, or very close to what he's saying in that fatwa so uh, so the answer is those common people Unfortunately, many of them have been convinced by those who are above them. And those who are above them have been told by some of those who are above them. Or they deducted, maybe not necessarily were told in a direct way, but they understood from them in this chain that these matters of knowing who is who, and who to take from and who not to take from, and who to write off from the manhaj and who to keep in the manhaj this is a very vital important matter that you should deal with it before anything else because if you don't you may take your knowledge from the wrong people that's how they convince them you know so so another and beside and then who who, who is going to tell us who to take from or not it boils down to two or three individuals in the whole world so it means that put, put blinds on my eyes and uh, what? Block my ears and make me uh, do exactly what you want and nothing else. Let me be a complete blind follower of you. That's what it means. And that we have to, 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 to accept what those Mashayikh say because they know better than us. They know better than us. These mashayikh make mistakes. And these mashayikh, even if they did not make mistakes, uh, even if what they said about the mistakes of the other mashayikh is true, but those other mashayikh are not out of the manage, as you understood from the words of Sheikh. 
And some of those mashayikh that are being blamed for having mistakes have served the da'wah more than those others that they are taking from put all together. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. You know, I said it before in some other places and I say it here that now you see people warning against Sheikh Abu Ishaq al Huwaymi and saying that his, his manhaj is not clear. He probably has said some statements that, that are incorrect. But from what we heard from him in hundreds of tapes, is that he is always calling to the Salafi manhaj. And he is carrying the Salafi aqidah. And he fights for it. And he educates people on it. And his tapes are educational tapes. When you listen to a tape by Sheikh Abu Ishaq, after you finish it, you find that you have learned something. You have, you come out your heart softened by his words. Your mind filled with the knowledge that he told you. And it is all authentic knowledge. Whereas, for some of those mashayikh, you come out of their lecture, and your heart is harder than when you started the lecture. And you feel hate against people. You want to kill that. And get of mistakes that some people make and every one of us is liable to mistakes and subhanallah you find that if we set some people as with the mission of digging the mistakes of those who dig the mistakes of others I'm sure they will come up with books full of mistakes but this is not the purpose and they will not accept it I know many people you they will never, for the, for, for the wealth of the world, want to waste time trying to dig for the mistakes of others. As I was saying uh, to some brother, I think earlier today, and uh, I mean, one has to be fair. They tell you, you know, if you say, I said now you have to be fair, they say, uh oh, he's talking about muwazana. And muwazana means when you are talking about somebody, you are mentioning his good points and bad points. And this is very bad. This is a no-no. Because if you make muwazana, that means you are trying to make the person acceptable. And that means you are making him, making the people swallow his mistakes as well as his uh, right things. But I'm not talking about this now. So what I'm saying take the person of Abdurrahman Abdul Khaliq. Abdurrahman Abdul Khaliq, he has many mistakes. And some of them are real serious. And Shaykh Al-Bani, rahimullah, during his life, he, in a number of tapes, I can count at least five and maybe more, maybe ten, he was criticizing his mistakes, people bringing him some of his books or statements, and he would criticize them and say, this is our brother and he's our student from al Madina, and I wish that he changes and repents and our door is fully open for him to come and visit us and sit with us and discuss these issues. Somebody like this, Abdul Abdul Khalid. I tell you, I was telling some brothers, I forgot who, one of you who, who are here, that uh, the Personally, I benefited from him before I benefited from any of the other people. And I have to mention this, and this is something occurred that he has uh, before his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. That me and many people like me, who were uncertain about aqidah, I first understood the, the Salafi aqidah from some of his booklets when I did not know anything but the Khalafi aqidah of al-Asha'ira. So some of the brothers, the Kuwaiti brothers, gave me a booklet by Abdurrahman Abdul Khalif and they said, read this book. And I read it and I saw in it the truth of the meaning of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what put me on in the right direction in matters of aqidah. And I am an example of many hundreds of examples. Huh? Thousands. Thousands. Right. So, so that does not mean that we are blinded about his mistakes and that we will accept his mistakes no matter what they are because we took some benefit from him no 
By Allah, no. This is not our manhaj. Our manhaj is to take the truth from wherever it comes and to reject the, the falsehood from wherever it comes. So to say now that we have to educate the common people, the little dwarves in knowledge, to educate them on attacks and on criticism before they have known the basics and the simplest matters of uh, aqidah and of manhaj, that's really a great injustice. And that is what is creating a great amount of hatred among our lines. A great amount of hatred. So that the brothers are mistrusting, mistrusting each other. And as the brother was telling me, he says every week there is a new name removed from the list. Every week a new name is removed from the list. And I know my name is now on the waiting list, as I told some brothers. Now I am tentatively, you know, on the border. So with a little push, maybe with what with these lectures today, my name will be out. So that's how we are dealing with individuals now. And the, the uh, uh, you know, the, the irony of it is that those people that are judging us are at the level, as I said it before, of not our students, but maybe the, if not even the students of our students, but their students in knowledge, in terms of knowledge and manhaj and da'wah. You know, when we first started with the Salafi da'wah in this country, I think you could count us on the, on the fingers of the two hands. I think probably from the whole area here, there was Salim, there was Kamal, myself, a few other brothers, very few in the, in the northeast. In addition to the brothers who, you know, the Kuwaiti brothers who came from overseas and so on. And then the brothers started entering slowly. And they started learning from us. And then others learned from them, and others learned from them. And those who came at the end, like some brothers, who embraced Islam like two or three years ago. And then two years ago, they became on this extreme line of Tabdiya. <coughs> a brother in Canada who's selling my books, who sells my books there, he has a bookstore and he sells my books. He told me, you know what, some of those brothers came to my bookstore and they told me, when you sell the books of Jibari, you have to put a disclaimer on them that he is unclear about some issues of Aqidah. I said, I wish that these brothers would come and make, give me a test on Aqidah, or I give them a test on Aqidah, to see what, how, what is their level of understanding of the Aqidah, or the manhaj. You know, uh, I remember uh, years ago, uh, when uh, I began to hear things about some of the dying, and the Dao was starting to grow. There was a lot of brothers. They used to go to a lot of programs from the USF. But then we started to hear, you know, I would hear about such and such kind of mistake here, and he's not. We started to hear the same uh, Quran. And subhanAllah, as we look from it, organization is formed, they got strong. And as a result, you know, like the uh, Jamaat sort of split up, half the brothers from where I had on and the Dao Diana, and then this Dao was spread all around the country. And then from their Kalam, they said things like, they, they took the position of the Shiyu and tried to be little. Because of the, uh, the uh, Jamia and those people who are uh, uh, the Dao, the, the callers to it, uh, callers to, to the Dao, they were the first ones to say, be careful of, 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 of Kalam. Be careful of Fulam. So this was the dawah of the brothers early on. Said be careful of Fulam, Fulam, Fulam. And as a result, we've seen what happened. So the Shalom HaTan, he gave us a clarity on how do we make a distinction between the two. But the thing was, it was a, it was a problem early on, you know, uh, from, from the people uh, who was, uh, you know, inviting the people to other than, you know, Fulam was who? From the other of the South South, from the, the, other, the other position there. Well, I mean, this is a hard question to answer. He's saying, I think this catches this from this distance, but still, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat some of what he's saying. He's saying that 
what are we supposed to do? Because from a number of years we were warned about some specific mashayikh or da'is, du'at, that we should be careful of them and not to take from them. And the question is, how do we know whom to take from and whom we shouldn't? Right? No, the question is, those people that were born again, those people that died, became big. And it exploded in the country and it divided up a lot of people who were the born to die. Right. So the result of that, and we were the ones that were saying, be careful, pull on, pull on. And now it's coming back to us, but we'll pile up. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, and what he's saying is that this has caused, caused splits in our lives. And another split, and another split. So every few years, like uh, what you call these cells that split, who knows biology? Yeah, amoeba. amoeba. So they split every few years, uh, every, uh, not few years. They, they generate or reproduce by splitting. So we grow a little bit, but then we split and we find ourselves smaller again. And then we grow a little bit and then we are smaller and smaller or the same size as ever before. And that's because we seem to be somehow nurturing this kind of feelings of animosity and hatred among us. And even though there are some individuals that we say do not take knowledge from them because on the overall they are not upon the manhaj and upon the clear manhaj or da'wah. Uh, but in general many of those that are warned against they're not like that. And as you heard from the words of the Sheikh, that if in general the person is upon the manhaj, but he has some mistakes here and there, because of his ishtihad, then you forgive those mistakes. And I believe that we should be at a level or train to be at a level where we can distinguish to some degree at least. We can discern that this person we can take from him the knowledge, but not everything. And this person, we cannot take anything from him because it's more b- bad than good. And this person, we can take from him almost everything that he has to say with just a few exceptions. So, uh, so we need to develop this kind of understanding in us. Uh, but I think that the people are at a level where they can distinguish. And as I gave the example of Abdurrahman Abdul Khaliq, you know, uh, from the beginning, I, believe, I, believe, I remember the first Salafi conference that was ever held in this country, which was in Ashland, Ohio, in 19, was it 1980 or 81? Do you remember? 81. 1981, exactly 20 years ago. I was translating for Sheikh Abdul Rahman Abdul Khalid in his lectures. He was talking, I was translating for him. And I disagreed with many of the things that he said, and I did not like them. But that did, ne- did not mean that I rejected everything that he said. So n- taking some truth from him it doesn't mean that it blinds me to the, ex- to the extent that I take everything from him. And vice versa. So what I'm saying is that people in general are not so dumb that, or they should not be so dumb as not to be able to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong, especially when they are given the understanding of the dalil, of the importance of the evidence. When you say something, you can give me the evidence for what you are saying. Where is the evidence from the book from the Sunnah? When you... What were... I forgot what fatawi that Sheikh Abdul Rahman gave in that conference. But there were many fatawi that were wrong. Fiqh fatawi. And they were against the evidence. And he did not accept them from him. And similarly in his view about da'wah in general. We disagree with some point. So what I'm saying is that uh, if, if we find mistakes with some people, it doesn't mean that those people, you cannot take anything from them. And I tell you that some of the individuals that we used to invite to our Quran and Sunnah Society conferences, some of the mashayikh, we knew and the brother know, and I used to tell them, at the level of the Majlis Shura that this Shaykh has such and such problems and this has deficiency in this area and this Shaykh has deficiency in that area so we should not give him lectures in this area or we should be careful when he answers questions in that area and so on like some of the Mashaykh that came to us from Egypt from Ansar Sunnah and others but on the other hand there was a lot of benefit coming from those, from those Mashaykh 
So we did not completely disown them and say we have nothing to do with them. We want the complete, perfect, pure individuals to come to our conferences. Where are they? I would like to see where, where are they? There was, there was one such person and he died 1400 years ago. So, so there are no perfect people anymore. There are, anybody that you will invite will make mistakes. And we see, we hear mistakes from our beloved brothers and Messiah that they come to the conferences still today. But that doesn't mean that we dislike them or hate them for that. No, we advise them and we take what they say what is right and we, we leave what is wrong. So I don't know if I answered the questions that were asked, at least to some degree. It is, it is hard to give full answer because as you see even in the, in the answer of the Shaykh, it is, it is a vague answer. He cannot give you a clear cut that he is making uh, so many mistakes therefore he is still okay or he is not okay anymore it is, it is a more of a uh, you know, general uh, question that you can know its answer by Allah Alam, by khibra, by experience okay, uh, one issue clarity sometimes the Shabab is going to give general fatality general fatawa on certain uh, types of sickness and and they take the general fatawa, fatawa and they apply it to a particular individual and I wanted to get them to explain uh, the position of this type of action in terms of the uh, proper procedures of proof is it correct or incorrect to take the general fatawa and apply it to one particular person like this for example let's say there's a general fatawa saying uh, don't cooperate with Akhil Bidda, for example. And then you have somebody applying that to a particular individual because that individual individually has to be evaluated if he actually Akhil or not. You know, I mean, well, that was the, uh, the way that the Sheikh answered in the question, in the, what we read. That he said, I cannot give a general question, a general answer to this question. He said that the people, when they answer this question, they go between Ifrat and Tafrit. They go excessive in one way, one direction or the other. And we have to be careful which individual we are talking about. So depending on the individual, we can give the answer. And to say that a person is of Ahl al-Bid'ah, we have to know uh, his overall manhaj or methodology and based on that, decide what he is. And another thing is that the decisions that come to us from whoever makes a decision, that does not mean that his decision is a final and perfect and cannot be questioned. Because those people who are passing judgments, they are also humans. And they also are liable to making mistakes. And we are not bound to take everything they say without questioning as, as if it is part of the Qur'an or the hadith of the Prophet And it is very appalling, as I told some brothers also, to see the, to what degree this has reached this kind of blind imitation, taqreed and hasbiya in regard to these issues of tabdiyya to the extent that we have been receiving emails from individuals who are very limited in their knowledge emails that say oh brothers or oh sisters and they are like uh, emails that are sent to large numbers of population, of people. They say, oh brothers and sisters, be careful, do not take any knowledge from this or that or that or that or that, and it counts about 20 or 30 names. And those people that are counted there, many of them are by the criteria that Sheikh gave, they are considered Salafis. They are considered to be on good manage. And those people that are, that are sending the emails, and this is also ironic, less than a year ago, they used to come to us and say, what, what do you have, what is the most recent book that you have by such and so and so author? And they ask us for it so that they can buy it and read it. Now they are sending emails, do not read for this author. So between one year and now, he has changed upside down or you changed upside down or what? How is this happening? What kind of... Madness is taking place in the world. 
And then they say, and this I heard it, they say, uh, Abu Abdullah Jibali has become too soft in his stance in regard to manhaj. I said, Subhanallah, I never change on my stand in the manhaj. Because the same people that I am saying the same things about them, I used to say, say the same things a few years ago when we used, to, we used to invite them to QSS. And certain individuals that now you do not want to read his books. Last year, you were asking me, please give me the last book that he published. That individual, he approached me on a number of times and asked me, Dr. Jibali, why don't you invite me to the conventions of QSS? And I never said anything to him. I said, maybe someday, inshallah. But I did not want to invite him because I know that he has some problems in his manage. So, we knew this from so many years ago. And things are clear to us about where each of these people stands. And how we are supposed to deal with them. And there is a certain amount of benefit we can take from them. Or we can allow the people to take from them. But now, you know, like children, they got a new toy and they are so happy with it. And they want to uh, challenge the whole world with this little toy that they got, with this little water gun that they got. So Allah Musta'an, I mean, it's, it's very sad, but uh, it is, it's real and it is happening. And we have to be patient in dealing with it. And ask Allah Azza wa Jal to open the eyes of the Ummah of the dua to see the truth and to be more sensible in dealing with the affairs and I ask Allah Azawajal to lead the mashayikh and we have started some talks with the mashayikh who are talking to those people underneath that they should be careful and that they are causing a lot of fitna and harm among the young and ignorant people and we are hoping that inshallah this will have some fruits and effects one Allahu Alam. Allah knows best. Okay. Uh, let us, since we have drifted so far, not probably too far, but a little far from the uh, actual subject of wasatiya, let's go back a little, inshallah, and try to cover it, or cover some good part of it before Maghrib. We have about. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes tomorrow. So inshallah we'll try to cover some of it now. And, and then finish the rest after the prayer. And hopefully we will have some time for questions and answers. Uh, we talked a little bit about the ayah of the Quran in which Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَصَفًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا And this is how we have made you as an intermediate nation so that you would be witnesses over the people it's over there I think and the Prophet will be a witness over you وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَصَطًا so Allah Azawajal is addressing the Muslims by saying, this is how we have made you... That's okay. Uh, that's why the cups keep going. Everybody's looking for cups. Where are they? This is how we have made you an intermediate nation so that you would be witnesses over the other nations. And... As in the authentic hadith, Recorded, reported by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and others, and recorded by al-Bukhari and others, that the Prophet ﷺ said, "Yud'a Nuh on Yom al-Qiyamah. Nuh will be summoned on the Day of Judgment. فَيُقَالُ لَهُ هَلْ بَلَّغَتْ He will be questioned. Did you deliver the message? And he will say, yes. His people will be brought forward or summoned. And they will say, they will be asked, did he deliver the message to you? They will say, مَا أَتَانَا مِنْ نَذِيرٍ وَمَا أَتَانَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ 
So on the day of judgment, they are lying. They say no. No, no uh, warner came to us. Nobody came to tell us anything. The people of Noah. So you call the Noah. Who do you So Noah will be asked, who do you have as witnesses? Muhammad wa ummatu. So he will say, Muhammad and his nation. فَذَلِكَ قَوْلُهُ And this is the saying of Allah in the ayah وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا And that is how we have made you as an intermediate nation. قال الْوَسَطُ الْعَدْلُ The Prophet وسلم is explaining. He said قال which means the Prophet وسلم said الْوَسَط The intermediate means in this ayah الْعَدْلُ The trustworthy The trustworthy nation. Which means Allah Azawajal trusted them as being the, the trustworthy witnesses that can bear testimony against the other nations. So you will be invited or summoned and you will testify that he delivered the message. And I will witness over you. Which means the Prophet ﷺ will say, yes, my ummah is saying the truth. So that's the meaning of the ayah. Even though the scholars have different interpretations of it, but it seems, as I think Imam uh, Sheikh Saadi rahimahullah said that this is, seems to be the most acceptable meaning, that وَيَكُونَ رَسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ shahida means he will be a witness over you that you have delivered the message. And not a shaheed against you like you were shaheed against the previous nations. So وَكَذَلْكَ جَعَلْنَاكُ أُمَّةُ So we made you a good Accept a trustworthy nation that you will be testi- uh, testifying against the other nations. And the Prophet is a witness over you. And here they discuss also why it says, shahida." In the first part it says, Shuhada'a ala nasi And the shuhada came before ala. And in the second part says, Rasulu alaykum shahida. They say the meaning coming from the understanding of the Arabic language is that to show that these, the particularity of the Ummah and that the Prophet ﷺ was chosen as the witness for this Ummah or over this Ummah. Which is a form of praise, in other words, for this Ummah. And another hadith relating to this ayah Also recorded by Al-Bukhari and Muslim from Anas He said The Muslims passed by a funeral So the people atnaw alayha khayra Which means they praised the people the, the, uh, That person, the deceased And the Prophet ﷺ when he heard that he said Wajabat, wajabat, wajabat. Which means, this is to pass, this is to pass, this is to pass. This is, or this is said to pass, which means this is accepted, accepted, accepted. And then, they passed by another funeral. And the people, أثنوا عليها فأثني عليها شرا. Which means the people, said bad things about the deceased in that funeral. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم, وَجَبَتْ 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 He again said the same thing. وَجَبَتْ 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 This is accepted, accepted, accepted. فَسَأَلَهُ عُمَرْ فَقَالْ Umar asked him, what, what did you say that? Why did you say this? And he said, Whoever you give مَنْ أَتْنَيْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ خَيْرًا وَجَبَتْ لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever you give a good praise of him, he will enter Jannah. And woman asnaytum alayhi sharra wajabat lahu nar. And whoever you give bad praise, which means blame for him, then he will enter the fire. Antum shuhada Allah ala fil ard. You are Allah's witnesses on earth. Antum shuhada Allah fil ard. Antum shuhada Allah fil ard. He repeated it three times. You are Allah's witnesses on earth. And then, 
In one of the reports, the Prophet ﷺ after this recited the ayah وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى لِتَكُونُ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ And that is how we have made you an intermediate nation so that you would be witnesses over the people. If you go to the books of Tafsir and they go to this ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah you will find a lot of benefits even though most of them revolve around what we said. If you go to, to Ibn Kathir for example or uh, Tabari or Alusi or other books of Tafsir so, uh, so they all mean about the same as Sa'di said وَسَطًا أَيْ عَدْلًا خِيَارًا That you are good and trustworthy وَمَا عَدَ الْوَسَطْ فَالْأَطْرَافُ دَاخِلَةٌ تَحْتَ الْخَطَرْ Other than the wasat, the middle, as you remember when we drew this uh, stick, other than the middle of the stick, the sides of it are in danger, which means extremes. If you go to either extreme, you are in danger. So Allah Azza wa made this ummah wasat in all affairs of the deen. I'm translating from as sadi In all affairs of the deen. Oh, this now. I have to turn like this <laughs> so that, that don't trip on it وَسَطًا فِي الْأَنْبِيَاءِ بَيْنَ مَنْ غَلَى فِيهِمْ كَالنَّصَارَ وَبَيْنَ مَنْ جَفَاهُمْ كَالْيَهُودِ Intermediate in regard to the prophets between those who want to the excessiveness in their regard like the Christians and those who deny their position like the Jews because the Christians made Isa alayhi salam son of God and made his students prophets and made other people made other, other people saints and prophets. Whereas on the other hand, the Jews they were killers of prophets. Whenever they have a prophet, a prophet they killed him or tried to kill him. And the last Four prophets that came, that ever came, were killed by the Jews or were attempted to be killed by the Jews. Right? Yahya, Zakaria, the son Yahya were killed by the Jews. And then Isa, they think that they killed him. But Allah raised him. They tried to kill him. And Muhammad وسلم, they poisoned him. And Allah saved him from death until he completed his message. So you see, they, that's their practice, to kill the Prophet. They have no regard for the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, belie- the believers on the other hand, the Muslims are intermediate. They do not go to the extreme or to the other extreme in regard to the Prophets. Wasatan fi sharia In regard to the laws, legislations, they are wasat, the believers. They do not go to excessiveness, to tashaddud, like the Jews, nor to ease, and relax to uh, leniency like the Christians and in other things inshallah we come to that when we show this, the chart Okay, now I'll actually I'll show the chart in the remaining five minutes that we have and by that we will conclude inshallah. Okay, this shows some examples of Ifrat and Tafrit and Wasatiyah and if we say that the true Muslims the people of the Sunnah and the followers of the Salaf are on the way of Allah, the Sirat of Allah, Sirat al-Mustaqeem 
so they are the wasat nation they are the wasat nation your brothers if they are the wasat nation then their path is the intermediate path and we see examples of how the different groups and nations deviated from this straight intermediate path of the sunnah either by ifrat or tafrit and ifrat as you remember from our definitions earlier yesterday ifrat is excessiveness doing too much of something and tafrit means falling short of some and uh, doing something doing too little of something so some would go to one extreme the others go to the other extreme in terms of following the messengers as we just mentioned the Christians had ifrat excessiveness the Jews had, had tafrit in terms of purification and food pahara and food the Jews had ifrat and as we see until now their kosher is much more strict than the halal food of the Muslims why they made it hard on them so Allah made it harder on them and similarly for cleanliness and things like that the religious Jews are very strict in those matters the Christians on the other hand are dirty, filthy, they eat everything so they are the opposite to the Jews in matters of sins and punishment now these are for different religions now talking about different sects in terms of sins and punishment the Muslims are in the middle course the Khawarij go to Ifrat the Murji'ah go to Tafrit Murji uh, I missed a little bit Morji Morji uh, The Morji'a go to Tafrit and the Khawarij go to Ifrat What do the Morji'a say or do? We, we mentioned this earlier today, you know? Okay. Okay, more exactly or precisely what we said today. Mujia say that the Iman is just saying statement, doesn't require deeds. Okay. How about the khawarij the Khawarij on the other hand? They make takfir. If one makes a sin, that's it. He is in the hellfire forever. A kabira. A major sin, he will never leave the fire, the hellfire. Okay, so this is the fire, this is tafrit. In Qadr, in matters of Qadr, the people of Sunnah are in the middle between Jabriya and Qadariya. What is the difference between Jabriya and Qadariya? We discussed this six, seven months ago, right? Eight months, nine months ago. They don't believe in the Qadr of Allah. Qadariya? Or Jabriya? Qadr, what does it mean they don't believe in the Qadr? They believe in the Qadr, but what? They believe it can be changed. That everything happens when it gives a bad is part of this, part of Qadr. That's what? what? Whatever bad deeds you do or good deeds is part of this Qadr. Yeah, Qadr. Yeah. That's, that's Jabriya. Yeah. Jabriya say, you remember when we discussed this? last time I was here and we said that Jabriya Al-Qadariya Qadariya also they call them al no no sorry Al-Jabriya are called Al-Qadariya they have another name Al-Qadariya Al-Milzima or something like that and Al-Qadariya these are Nufat which means they negate Al-Qadar these say Al-Jabriya say that everything that we do is is ordained on us our sins are ordained so everything we do Allah wanted us to do it 
So we have no control over it. We made a mistake, Allah made, made, caused us to make it. So why is He punishing us for, for it? Therefore He is unjust. The Qadari on the other hand, they say, Allah has no hand in anything that we do. He has totally no control over it. So it's close to what the brother here said. We have the Qadri and re- reject the, actually the, the belief in the Qadr. Allah has no uh, control over our destiny. It is totally uncontrolled. But what we say, people of Sunnah say that Allah ordained everything, but He did not, He does not enforce us, which means He knew ahead of time what we are gonna, going to do. And this has been recorded. But it doesn't mean that he forces us to do it. And we gave an example, if I remember, I don't know if it was in this place or some other place. I think it was here, that the example was, if, if there is a, uh, a principle, and this, we heard it from, uh, I believe, Sheikh Safat Nuruddin, uh, that, it's a good example, he said, if there is a teacher, a, a principal in a school, and the first day of school he goes into the cla- one of the classes, or he looks at the yard where the kids are playing, and he observes them, and from his long experience, being 30, 40 years principal in a school, in an elementary school, he could see from the actions of the students, that some of them are bright students. And some of them are not as bright, even though they are new students in the school. So, so somebody would ask him, what do you think about this student? And he says, he will fail at the end of the school. And the other will pass with very good marks. Does it mean that he knows al ghaib or that he is going to force this to fail and this to pass? Not necessarily. He, he has experience, he has knowledge. So Allah Azza wa has the full experience and full knowledge about everything in us and in the world. Can't He know ahead of time what we will be doing? Can't He ordain it and decree it and write it? Record it? Yes. But that doesn't mean that He is forcing us to do it. So, uh, so that's the position of Ahl Sunnah. Uh, and in terms of Allah's attributes, the Ahl Sunnah is in the middle between al Mu'attila and Mushabbiha. Ma'atila, those who negate the attributes of Allah, the sifat of Allah, uh, or suspend their meanings if they don't totally negate them. And the mushabbiya are those who liken Allah to His creatures. So the mushabbiya would say Allah comes down to the lowest heaven like a person comes down the stairs from one level to the other. He, he, uh, makes istiwa on the throne like a person would sit on a chair. He sees with his eyes which have the uh, white part and the black part and whatever, the pupil, etc. like us and so on. And they start likening Allah to his creatures. His hand is like our hands, his uh, face is like our faces and so on. That is Mushabbiha. Ma'atila on the other hand, they say, he has no hands. His hand is his power. And his face is his acceptance. And uh, rising above the throne meaning overpowering the throne. And coming down to the lowest heaven means his mercy goes down to the lowest heaven. Uh, And so on. The people of Sunnah, they do not go to this extreme of ifrat or tafrit. They say, we believe in all of the attributes of Allah as He described Himself in His book or in the sunnah of His Messenger Wasallam, but without likening them to the attributes of His creation. So He has a hand, but His hand is unlike our hands. And unlike any hand that we know or can imagine. And He comes down but without, he is above the throne, that's what Istawa al Ash means. But it doesn't mean that he is attached or sitting directly on the throne in contact like people would sit. He is above the throne and above everything. 
And he comes down to the lowest heaven while he is still above the throne. And all of these, say, uh, many of these things are things that we cannot comprehend with our limited knowledge. How can we encompass Allah with our knowledge? And he says, What are you Alma? But we believe in what he tells us. He has hands, he has fingers, he has eye, he has face, he descends, and he is above the throne, and he has wisdom and knowledge and all that as he described himself and different from what any of his creation describes him uh, so uh, so this is the position of Ahl Sunnah in regard to the Sifat of Allah in regard to Ali and Ahl al-Bayt the family of the Prophet the people of Sunnah Ahl Sunnah are in the middle as usual the Shia to go to the excessive position of putting Ali and his family and his descendants above normal people putting them at the level of prophethood they say that they are Imams and they continue to receive Wahi up to the 12th Imam so in other words they make them prophets but they don't call them prophets they call them Imams uh, the, uh, on the other extreme there are Nasiba there are, there are not too many of them in our time But they were at the time of the Umawis When there were the political conflicts between the Shia And their enemies uh, uh, Or started by the fight between Ali and Muawiyah Then there were people who would curse Ali radiallahu an On the member And would declare hatred of Ali and his families and his descendants and this continued until the Abbasis came until the end of the Umawi era so these are Nasibah they go to the other extreme in regard to the family of the Prophet Wasallam. when we are commanded to be good to them but not to be excessive in their regard as Allah Azzawajal says قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلْكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَةِ which means say I am not asking you for any reward for it, for my revelation to you, except to be good to my family, to my relatives. In regard to scholars and shaykhs, the Ahl Sunnah are in the middle, the Sufis and the Muqallida, those who imitate blindly, they go to the one extreme of 